Thanks everybody for being here. This is Communication and Bargaining Breakdown and Empirical Analysis. Uh, this is joint work with excellent co-authors, Thomas Blake, who's at Amazon, uh, Jet Peters, who is my current RA, starting her PhD at MIT in economics uh, next year. So look for her in about five or six years and Stephen Tadellis at Berkeley. This is a paper that comes out of a long sort of sequence of papers uh, studying best offer bargaining on the eBay platform. And I'll introduce that in a moment. Let me start by motivating the question itself. Uh, we're interested in studying the effects and the role of communication and bargaining in an online platform. Uh, there's two big picture reasons for why we're interested in this question. The first is about the design of bargaining protocols, since so many of our transactions, economic and otherwise, are conducted through bargaining. Right? Communication is at stake when we think about, say, shuttle diplomacy versus caucus negotiations. Those are just two ways of moderating communication in international conflicts. Mediation and arbitration services and personal negotiations you could think of as just another way of restricting communication. Now that's sort of the high flying and abstract motivation for why we care about the question. Closer to our application and closer to the ground is the question of platform design. For instance, on Saatchi Art, the platform has to decide whether to allow you to communicate with the artist from whom you are buying artwork as you bargain. Taobao, which has about 116 billion in GMB in 2016, allows bargaining and allows open communication. And eBay, which is our empirical setting and has 100, or sorry, 84 billion in GMB in 2016, approximately 10% of which are best offer negotiations where text communication can be allowed between the parties. And the question is, is that a good thing or a bad thing for the platform? So we looked to the, to the literature when we started this and we found very little empirical evidence. So the main contribution we think is to offer the first empirical evidence on the role of communication and facilitating bargaining. We're gonna use data from eBay's best offer platform. And we have a natural experiment in the introduction of messaging on the platform because it was only partially rolled out to desktop, but not to mobile users. There are two main results. One is that there's an economically and statistically significant positive effect of communication on bargaining success. And two, examining the dynamics, there seems to be something interesting happen. And by opening it up a little bit further with text analysis, we found evidence that, that sellers were learning how to use the messaging features uh, in order to guarantee more transactions. So first, let me set this up by telling you a little bit about the environment. So here I've gone shopping for art on eBay. Um, I'm looking for Jean-Michel Bascat, and I find this $4,425 listing, Bone Samo. And underneath the price, you can see that it says, or best offer. And what best offer is, is a feature that's enabled now by default uh, for the sellers. It wasn't at the time um, where I could pay this listing price or if I click, so this is the search results page. If I click on the listing, here's the item description page. What you'll see is that underneath buy it now where I would normally click to purchase the item, there's an option called make an offer. And if I click that make an offer, a pop-up will appear. Let's focus on the top panel here in English, right? This is the pop-up that would appear, which would prompt me to enter a number, which is the offer that I'm willing to make. And if I then review my offer and submit it, the seller will have 48 hours to either accept, reject, or counter. And if they counter, then I will have 48 hours to accept, reject, or counter, and so on in a procedure that looks a lot like Rubenstein Shaw alternating offers bargaining, okay? So that's the best offer platform. And we've written a few papers at this point studying bargaining in the setting because we think it's sort of the biggest, best empirical setting where we have data on offers uh, uh, within transactions in bargaining, okay? But that's the US platform. What we're going to talk about today is not really the US platform, but we're actually going to focus on eBay.de, which is the German incarnation of eBay, which is slightly different because its origins go back to a company that founded it basically mimicking the eBay site in the US and recreating it in Germany, and they didn't quite get the copy perfect. One of the things that was originally missing, so here you see the pop up that appears on eBay.de, a couple things are different. One, I can't read it because it's all in German, but two, what you're gonna see is that under, under the offer box in the US, there was a box, uh, an option that said, add a message to seller. And underneath that in Germany, there was, we've highlighted where it would have been, there is no such option to send a message to seller. We were perplexed by this. We begged them to run an experiment. We asked why this feature wasn't there. There was no institutional knowledge or understanding of why it wasn't there. All we got back were jokes about Germans. And so we decided that this was an opportunity. We begged them to run the experiment. We were a little bit, I think, too persuasive in that instead of running an experiment, they just turned the option on. Okay, so May 23rd, 2016, communication was enabled on eBay.de. We didn't get our experiment. 
But what we did get, it turns out, was a natural experiment in the way that the rollout happened. So first, we should ask what else is happening in Germany? Not a whole lot. Most importantly, this was not bundled with a large suite of, of site changes, as often changes on platforms, especially eBay, would be in, say, the spring or fall updates. But there are a lot of holidays in May. Those are observables. What's unique about the rollout is that the website was updated, so users on a desktop viewing ebay.de would see the change and the text message availability, but the mobile app was not. And so users using the mobile app, which at the time were about half of German users on the site, would not be able to send text messages to sellers. Adoption was approximately instantaneous, okay? And about 6% of bargaining interactions after the introduction on May 23rd included a message. That's a little bit lower than in the US where the number is about 10% based on our other papers, but still pretty substantial and it was almost instantaneous after the introduction. Okay, so with that natural experiment in hand, the first thing that we set out to do was just to ask what is the causal effect of the availability of text communication on the likelihood of bargaining success. We were interested in whether you were more likely to transact based on some prior experimental work, uh, in particular some experimental results that suggest that it might be the case that allowing communication by bargainers allows you to outperform the sort of upper bounds on uh, the, the Meyerson Satterthwaite upper bounds on what should be possible in a rational model with two sided asymmetric information. So that's why we were interested in this question. What I'm showing you here is the main table of results from the paper. And I'm going to go sort of step by step with this. So for each of these specifications, we have desktop users, mobile users, and this is where the buyer or the seller was desktop versus mobile. Then we're going to do in diff and diff, and then we'll do an IV. And we're going to do all of these with and without a large set of controls. We have things like the set of holidays, new and used, and so on. Okay. Now, the first thing we did with just the raw data was to ask, is there any effect of the introduction among desktop users? This is a simple pre-post, okay? So we're not controlling for any secular trends with a control group, and we get about a half a percentage point effect, which note seems economically small, but in fact, it's quite large because remember the adoption rate was only about 6%. So you'd wanna blow that up to work out what the treatment effect on the treated was, and we'll do that in columns seven and eight. Okay. Once you add controls, however, in particular, once you add a time trend in this regression, then the effect goes away. And in the paper, what you can see when we actually plot the data is that what's happening is that there's an upward trend in the post period. And so that's what the time trend is catching here. If we do the same exercise for mobile users, which were not treated, right, we get no effect either with or without controls, nothing statistically significant. So the idea of the diff and diff is going to be to use the mobile users who were never exposed to text messages on the platform as a control group to deal with secular trends. That's going to identify the time trend. And then we'll use the difference in those differences, right, pre, post, desktop, mobile, in order to get the causal effect of the introduction of communication on the platform. So mobile users are capturing the secular trend, and then the pre, post is getting at the introduction. That's what specifications five and six do. We can ignore the controls, no controls now because you get basically the same result. That half a percentage point effect comes back, okay? So that's what we're taking as our intent to treat estimate. It's an intent to treat because the compliance rate is so low. This is the effect of the availability of communication. Now, if you wanted to convert an intent to treat to a treatment effect on the treated, there's a simple trick in applied econometrics to do that. And that's to take this interaction and use it as an instrument in the regression instead of as a regressor. And when we do that, that's going to rescale the intent to treat up to a treatment effect on the treated. It's not, I want to be cautious here because when I say an instrument, I'm not introducing any new variation. All I'm doing is rescaling it to get at the treatment effect on the treated. And that turns out to be about seven and a half percentage points. Okay, so that is economically large. That's, you can think about that as rescaling the half a percentage point effect to account for the fact that there was so much, so little adoption. Remember only 6%, okay? So a seven and a half percentage point effect is about the scale that we're dealing with, which is quite large on a baseline of about 45% uh, bargaining success, okay? Now here you're gonna see that time trend that I was telling you about. All the regressions I've shown you so far have been in the window four weeks before and four weeks after. Here, what I've done is I've rerun the regression, okay? But now I'm adding week-specific fixed effects. So you can see by week, 
what the effect of the introduction was. Now, part of the reason we do this regression, this goes back to Outdoor 2003, is because by adding pre-change effects, that's what these are over here, you can actually test your parallel trend specification. Right? If you fail parallel trends, the assumption behind the stiff and diff design, then sometimes you'll see a causal effect before the event. That doesn't make any sense, and you would treat that as a reason to reject the findings. We don't see any statistically significant effects prior to the introduction, which we've normalized here being between week zero and week one. Okay, After the introduction, we see a slow increase in the size of the effect, which then stabilizes somewhere around about a half a percentage point. Okay, Now, we're treating this now, I mean, the, the generous way to treat this would be to say that there's some dynamics to the treatment effect that's happening here. And one way, one reason you might believe that would happen is if people were actually learning what kinds of messages to send. In other words, if it weren't obvious, just given the availability of text communication, what you should send in order to increase the likelihood of a transaction. Okay, and so to put some meat on the bones of that story, we opened up a text analysis exercise to try to figure out what people were actually saying in these messages. Okay, so the weak specific effects were suggestive of convergence to some kind of equilibrium or some kind of learning behavior. Can we see any evidence of this in the messages? So we did this text analysis of about 250,000 messages. It starts with cleaning. This is all pretty standard now. Most people I think have seen a little bit of natural language processing. We only use German messages. We remove numbers, symbols, and stop words and limitize to remove tense. Okay, note that this is gonna be entirely descriptive. I have no causal variation in what people say. We take a bag of words approach, in particular, a bag of bigrams, and we're gonna do it separately for buyers and sellers. And the simplest way we did this was say, take all the messages that were sent in week one, concatenate them into one document, week two, another document, week three, and so on. And then let's ask about the similarity of what people are saying between week one and two, one and three, one and four, and so on. And so we're using a cosine distance measure to test that. And that's what we see here, okay? So I'm starting off with buyers. The cosine distance between week one and week one is zero, and that's why on the diagonal, you always see these fully shaded in cells. When you compare week one to week two, week one to week three, and so on, thanks fire truck, uh, what you see on the buyer side is noise. There's nothing to see in this particular heat map of the cosine distance, okay? That's for buyers. For sellers, we see a much more interesting pattern. What we see for sellers, and I'm gonna focus on the bottom gradient, the similarity, sorry, the cosine distance to week 10, okay? What we see is a consistent gradient. In other words, the things that people are saying in week one are very different from what they're saying in week 10, less different in week two, less different in week three, and so on. In other words, sellers seem to be converging slowly to something that's more similar ultimately to what they say in week 10. Moreover, if you wanted to study convergence, what you would hope for is some sort of convex pattern, and that's what you can see in the off diagonals. It's a little bit hard to see here, but if you focus on the off diagonals, right, as you move later on in the period, you get a little bit more similar. It's that convex learning pattern that we expect from models of learning. And so the argument is that this is a motivation for interpreting this movement of the weak specific treatment effects as people converging to a pattern, of sell, a pattern of messages. Now, by the way, why are we getting garbage for buyers? The answer is because the modal buyer shows up once on eBay and leaves. So there's no room for learning, right? The reason we're seeing these patterns for sellers, and we're going to focus on them from now on, is because those are the persistent, the long run users on the platform. And that's where we should expect to see some learning. All I've done in these pictures here is redrawn those heat maps to focus on the two elements I was telling you about. The bottom gradient, which is telling you about how similar the messages are to week 10. Again, with buyers, we see noise, but with sellers, we see this slow convergent pattern to what they're saying in week 10. And then on the bottom two pictures, what I've done is I've plotted the off diagonal, okay, where the delta is telling you which off diagonal we're looking at, right? So just one off diagonal is gonna be delta one. Delta seven is gonna be seven periods distant, week one versus week eight, two versus nine, three versus 10. We have fewer observations for that, of course, because it's a bigger differencing exercise. What the downward pattern in these off diagonals tell you is that there's a convex pattern. You could also see it visually here. We're moving more between week one and week two, two and week three, than we are between seven and eight and eight and nine, which is what you would expect from a learning model. Okay. 
The last thing I'm going to show you before I wrap up this presentation is a little bit of motivation for believing that what we're finding in those convergent patterns, which we contend are learning among sellers about what to actually say, this is a little bit of motivation for believing that that might have something to do with the correlation between bargaining success and messaging. What we've done here is constructed a new variable at the message level, which is the cosine similarity between a given message and the corpus of text that were sent in week 10. So we're taking week 10 as standing in for the more experienced style of message, since that's what sellers are converging to. And then we're asking about the similarity to that. And what we see is that if we try to predict the likelihood that a bargaining transaction is successful, conditional on that, there's a positive correlation. In other words, sending a message that is more similar to what we send in week 10 is more likely to be successful. Now in the paper, we try to read the tea leaves a little bit and we do a few models to try to back out what kinds of messages people are sending that are more successful. There were a couple of interesting things that related to some of the work that's been done in the psychology literature on bargaining. In particular, being kind and being nice, but not effusive seems to be more successful, as well as there was some evidence that pointing out more subtle costs that buyers might not be aware of, for instance, PayPal fees, seem to be more likely to, to be met with success. Okay, so let me go ahead and wrap up because I'm about out of time. The question that we started off trying to ask was, does communication on bargaining platforms facilitate successful bargaining? This is something there's been some evidence from the experimental literature, back and forth evidence from theory, but no persuasive empirical evidence from the field. And that's what we're trying, where we're trying to fill the gap. We find on eBay.de, if you send a message that was correlated with a seven to eight percentage point increased likelihood to succeed on a baseline of 44%. We also found some evidence of learning in the dynamics of the treatment effect, which was mirrored then in the content of the text messages as measured by a bag of bigrams approach. Uh, as with, with most of our work, this, this raises at least as many questions as we managed to answer. We offered some descriptive evidence, but the question remains, what are bargainers saying? Can we get causal estimates of what they're saying that's actually affecting outcomes? What is the mechanism by which this matters, right? Is it something behavioral? Is some meaningful information being communicated? And then of course, the golden question for these platforms, which is what is the optimal communication protocol on a platform? And of course, most importantly, because there's been so little empirical work done on these kinds of bargaining questions, you know, the thing that we'd like most, you know, most of all for, for more researchers in this space to, to explore is new sources of data, right? We're seeing more bargaining on online platforms. We think this is an opportunity to open up these questions that have been largely experimental or theoretical, and we're excited about new work in that direction. All right, I'll stop there. Thank you.